We are live on the Gamification Revolution. I'm your host, Gabe Zickerman. So excited to have you all here. Welcome, welcome. It's a beautiful, sunny, although weirdly not quite springtime yet day in New York City. And I'm joined today by Travis Rich and Kevin Hu from the MIT Media Lab in Cambridge. Hello, guys. <laughs> Hello, thanks so much. We're super excited. Yay, I'm so excited to have you. And I know that everybody who's watching us is excited to hear um, about the cool things that you're working on. But before they do, they need to get logged into the Spreecast platform. And those of you who've been here before, you know how to do this, but if it's your first time, you'll need to log in with one of your social media accounts to be able to chat with us. And once you're logged in, you can chat with all the people on the sidebar, everyone who's talking. You can also ask us questions. You can actually ask any of us a question. And if you've got a camera, you can even come on and we'll bring you on the show and you can ask your question live and in person with us and I'll moderate those questions. And for those of you who are back again this week, welcome back again uh, to the show. It's always good to have you. I see lots of folks here, Seamus, Dutch, Lori, David, welcome back. And for those of you who don't know, Gamification Summit is coming up in June, gsummit.com. You can uh, get a discount to the show by using the code GAMREV. Lots of exciting stuff. We just announced that uh, Dr. BJ Fogg, Professor BJ Fogg, uh, will be one of our special keynotes and offering a great uh, new master class in behavioral design at G Summit. We just announced that yesterday. And those of you who follow the space of designing for behavior and designing for engagement, of course, know uh, Dr. Fogg's work uh, from Stanford, where he runs the behavior lab there. And he's going to be doing an, a brand new master class and a brand new keynote in which he'll be revealing new results from his research on behavior. He's cracked an important code about how we turn short-term behavior into long-term habits with users. And he's going to be sharing that for the first time on the stage at G Summit in June. So it's very exciting if you're in the market to learn how to design for behavior and design for engagement. It's gsummit.com, and I hope that you'll be able to join us there. Now, let's turn our attention to the lovely, lovely gentlemen from Cambridge and talk to them about their project. Guys, tell us, what is GIF GIF? That's a good question. Um, so, so GIF GIF is our attempt at uh, mapping this language that people are using online of, of animated GIFs. Um, it started back a few months ago when we were we were talking about uh, some of these like hard questions about uh, how do you know what a person knows or how do you communicate what you know eloquently to somebody. Um, and we, we started to realize that people were using animated GIFs to do, do just that on the internet. Um, which the internet having been predominantly a very cold uh, platform for many years, you can see through YouTube comments that are hateful and internet trolls and all these terrible, unempathetic things that happen on, on the world online. Um, there's not a lot of empathy going around, but with the advent of people using animated GIFs, uh, you can see people start to sort of have conversations, not with text, not with video, but by just sending across these little clips that sort of convey I just had the most perfect burrito in the world, and now I'm on cloud nine, and nothing could be better. And there's a, that perfect gift that gets just that. Um, but, but the problem with finding that gift is if you want that burrito, you have to search through tags. Whereas we figured out that using a system of A-B comparisons, and you're asked which gift is more is more uh, exciting, right? Which one displays more excitement? And you vote uh, over uh, what is now millions of votes. You can come out with a ranking and a scoring of every of over 5,000 gifts on 17 emotions. Right, and we've actually put the uh, link to the project there in the uh, uh, underneath the video, so folks can actually go check it out. And you know, I that resource is amazing. I use uh, animated gifs, and we're going to talk about this gif gif divide in a minute. I love that you guys are saying it the hard g. It's how I I I crave to say it, but. Um, I feel like the wall of history is against me on this one. Uh, I use the resource all the time, actually, to find the exact right thing. So it's a cataloged set of GIFs uh, with people expressing different emotions, uh, enthusiasm, excitement, anger, frustration, contempt. It really, really fascinating stuff that's very useful for this visual language. Um, and I use this resource all the time. So you are having people vote, which I notice is the kind of activity on the on this sort of front page. Is it hard to get people to give that kind of information? Why did you, uh, you know, what have you kind of seen from the process of, of asking the crowd to rate these uh, GIFs for you? I think the, the key thing we found is that people actually like animated GIFs. And so more, more so than we were expecting, they're staying on the site, not on the search page, not on the results page, which we think is like our value. We did some work and now you get the search tool. They're staying on the page where they just vote, where they do the work for us because they get to see these random gifts and they get to see these sort of expressionful emotions conveyed in these these frames. 
Uh, so we're actually getting really good traffic on on Devote. We had at one point, I think we had about like when we first crossed a hundred thousand, or sorry, when we first crossed a million votes, we only had about a hundred thousand users. So we were getting an average of about ten votes per user. So they were actually staying and voting, which is pretty good. Um, and I think it comes down to the fact that it's not so much we've made this perfect game out of the system. It's that we chose something people already like to do, and we just sort of instead of just having them do that on their own, either browsing through Reddit or browsing through Tumblrs, we just collected it in a new way that that put put meaning to what their browsing history was going to be anyways, I guess. Right. Uh, but but given the material that we're working with GIFs, we uh, want to design around delight, which I, and we, we put thought into like the, the achievements, for instance, like we got a lot of good feedback on, well, the achievements are so much fun. And then like, there goes my night, right? Or <laughs> there goes our, our weekend. Right. right. People like the things that don't get them anything in the long run, but it is that perfect little serotonin kick in, in the moment of, voting 40 times and getting an explosion of fireworks and gifts. Well, let's talk about that actually, because I, I know that the folks watching are gonna to wanna to understand the rationale and the things that you've learned behind the design. So one of the things is people can vote and as they vote, if there's sort of some a visual feedback and numerical feedback based on their vote and also based on that image. Can you talk about how that uh, sort of feedback system works? Yeah, so I mean, I think the I think the, the reason for the achievements, I think, at the beginning was because we, we wanted people to return to the site. We wanted people to come back to the site and vote in multiple states because uh, there's a very good chance that you come to the state and something bad just happened. You've had a bad day at work. You've had a bad day uh, yeah, with your spouse or your boyfriend or girlfriend or something. You come and you vote on these gifts and you have this bias towards just voting everything more angrily or more upset than you normally would have. And so we can get that bias skewed. And so by having people promoting them to come back to the site over and over, we get a better average, we were hoping, um, across all of their different emotional states that they might be in. Uh, and so that's why we have we have certain achievements like voted on multiple days or voted across multiple weeks or multiple months um, to try to like remove some of those those voting biases that might have popped up otherwise. Right. And so the achievements are, some of them are pretty basic, just vote counts where you voted once, you voted five times. Other ones, like Travis said, are I'm voting on different days or voting on different times of the day. Sure. So nine to five, your chief is working hard. <laughs> I think it's a, it says you're not at work, right? And it's uh, it's oh, actually yeah, kind of, yeah. it's actually kind of funny. Anyone who just played with it a second ago would have gotten it, right? Because we're between nine nine yeah, to five yeah, yeah. right now. So some of it is about the surprise and delight, and some of it is about um, driving some sort of behavior, d d specific behaviors. Did you um, pattern this off of any particular examples that you saw? Like how influential were things like Foursquare, GetGlue, um, other kinds of gamification models um, in, in the design and thinking about how you, you went after this? Uh, I mean, I think, I think there was a little bit of like 12-year-old Travis first getting an Xbox and like first getting so excited about not even the games that were coming out, but the fact that they just implemented achievements, or sorry, Xbox 360 when they came out with achievements. Um, and just being so excited to get these little icons for some reason that like, even though the games were the same games and they were still just as fun, the fact that now I had some way of like tracking the fact that like, yeah, I did spend a lot of time playing Final Fantasy VIII, it means that I can sort of, I don't know, let you reflect on a way that, that your time doesn't feel wasted, but it feels like you actually built something up. Right. And yeah. I, yeah, sorry. Go yeah, ahead. I guess the answer is we didn't look too much at prior templates or prior work, but like, we both played video games a lot when we were younger. I still play video games. We were just asking ourselves, what are the, the achievements that we would want to see? What's the system that we'd want to use and contribute to? And especially on online games, like the great examples like Cookie Clicker that just show you can take like the most mindless thing of, I don't know if you guys have seen the Cookie Clicker, like <laughs> JavaScript game, and you, there's literally just a cookie and you click it and like, <laughs> there's nothing else, but like you get achievements for doing that. And like it's it's popular enough to be spreading across the internet and to, to get you to sit there for like a few hours and leave your browser open and collect cookies just to get these little icons. So uh, yeah, we didn't, we didn't, I think we didn't put, we were putting a lot of our emphasis into the sort of design of the search and the results and the, the actual voting functionality, but we put the achievements as a way of knowing that for us that works to sort of drive engagement high and, and retain, retain users. So uh, it was a simple, simple tool. One of the interesting uh, observations that I have about that is obviously you guys are kind of younger and you're talking about this this notion of uh, you know what would you as gamers want to design and what what was inspiring to you as you know kids who played games and how this maps to that world um, and that that felt just sort of very intuitive to you. Could you did you consider or could you imagine 
the system without the achievement? So what, what role do the achievements actually play in the outcome? Um, how important are there? Was there any scandal or pushback about them? How do they, you know, badges are sometimes controversial. One of, one of the inspirations for GIF GIF was this project called Place Pulse, uh, which also came out of a media lab. It tried to use the same A-B testing to map urban perception. So you showed two uh, Google Street Street View images and you asked which one is safer. But what we noticed is that it, it, is, it doesn't pull you in, right? It doesn't draw you in quite as much. Uh, so we wanted to add a way to like, constantly reinforce and support the user. Uh, yeah, like, of course, some people just like dive in and go after a hundred or a thousand gifts. But the person who just do one, if we can make them do five or ten, and it kind of give them some more joy, that was the goal. And and totally honestly too, we were we we built them with a little bit of motivation just to make the project a little sillier and a little more playful. Like the the first achievement, the one vote achievement you have is one of our friends Matt doing like <laughs> a jig in a room full of balloons, and we put it there just to like. For the motivation, like we have to make this project go viral because we need to have everyone in the world see Matt look like an idiot dancing in this room full of balloons. So, so sort of that playful aspect of it, I think, was definitely part of the motivation of just like, if we're going for delight, let's get our own delight as well as everyone else's delight for the project. Well, and I think a little bit of playfulness and fun is actually uh, uh, important, right? We often think of that as being not important. We say that's an add-on or as long as the core functionality and purpose. But to be honest, people can do a million different things. They could be doing anything, yeah. including the GIFT GIFT project or not, right? So this is right. just a, you know get, trying to get them to feel excited and engaged around it is meaningful. I, I have to tell you that many of the folks in the chat are expressing like, uh, like Beth and Dutch are saying that they're a little bit addicted your project already. <laughs> we got a lot. We got a lot of. <laughs> we have, we're, just see, we're just seeing it now. They're but yeah, I mean that's that's part of the, that's part of why I think we thought the idea was was really compelling at the beginning because it even just having the voting comparison uh, would be fun on its own because sitting there looking at these is, is fun. But if we can somehow turn those clicks as opposed to just clicks to refresh the next page or something into some meaningful data that we can use to to build a better tool to build a better dictionary of language, then then that's that's a win win for everyone. So. Right. Um, we're glad to see the addiction is catching up. Ha! Huh. Yeah, it's, it definitely gets my attention as well. So, so another piece of the equation is there's some stats about the way that people responded to. Um, you've got like a little mini leaderboard for each one of the uh, emotions that shows up uh, when you're actually looking at different things. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Why do you show those stats? Why are those little leaderboards important? What was the motivation behind doing it? Right. Well, uh, part of it is precedence. Uh, because Place Pulse also showed analyses, and then we uh, wanted to keep in the same vein. Uh, but for for the most part, it illustrates a very interesting uh, like dynamic of change of these gifts, trying to show that you know these are constantly updating that your vote does affect the score of these gifts because it's a time series, right? Every gift starts off with a default score, but then it converges uh, to a true score in some sense. Yeah, and I think there was a little bit of uh, visual language that we wanted to push across that, that yes, we've made a GIF site that's sort of playful and it has fireworks and it has laughing kittens and everything like that, but we're actually also doing some pretty serious data science on the back end. And so we wanted to at least show that we, we are not just using this data to say like, okay, this one's in first place and this one's in second, but we're doing some more rich analyses on it. And that's actually one of the, the next things that we're planning is we're going to be releasing uh, results of, of what we found and, and very detailed quantified uh, analytics on everything that we've collected so far. And so that little bottom uh, rankings just sort of hints at this is on our mind. We're not just collecting this for the sake of, of making a catchy site. We're collecting this to actually do science, to actually do some research, and right. to actually get some data out of it. Right. So we can answer questions like, how does uh, geographic and cultural variation affect perception of different emotions? Uh, we've seen uh, ESL teachers say that they're using GIF GIF to teach their students. Right. We can do computational uh, image analysis to see like what are the elements of the happy gift. Right, yeah. What are what are the, what's like the computational footprint of a gift that highly ranks on happiness versus highly ranks on anger. Um, and so a lot of these things, some some articles which uh, which we, we didn't necessarily say these words, but we don't necessarily disagree with the articles either, <laughs> have been claiming that that we can use such data to teach computers emotion, right? Because now a computer that can do an image image processing to match two gifts can say, I know this one's in the gift gift database and it conveys this emotional content of happiness and anger and sadness. And therefore, when I'm going to send my user a warning message, instead of saying, hey, you're about to break your computer, I can just put a GIF of, of an Adventure Time Jake freaking out and getting upset, right? So 
it, it communicates on, on a level that's different than just text. Uh, and so all this quantitative data can let us have computers do that as well. So, right. so, um, uh, so there's a kind of question that comes into that, I think, from all crowd working examples. Because in this particular case, what we're doing is we're trying to get the crowd to do some work for us that, you know, historically we maybe never could have done. It was never uh, accessible. It would have been too expensive to do. Or we'd have to pay people a lot of money to do. Or that a computer would do very poorly and would be spending a lot of time building an algorithm to do it, as you just described. Um, yeah. Can you talk about, you know, how we get people to do that kind of crowd work when we're not like expressly paying them to do it? I think the examples like a gift gift are the ones that people are very attracted to thinking about, and and also the Google Image Labeler, uh, which uh, was one of the things that uh, Luis von Ahn, who's the creator of um, Duolingo, made famous. Are examples where we are getting people to do work that. In theory, they should be paid for, they be paid for but they're really doing it because it's kind of fun for, for that, ultimately. For that. They're getting yeah. something out of it. There's some, sort of fun. There's some sort of fun. Right. Can you talk about the idea behind that and the scale of that? And what, what do you see as the opportunities for that? I think, I think it will, a lot of it just comes down to sort of clever strategizing and clever uh, manipulation. There's a whole set of things that we need to get done, and there's a whole set of things that people want to do. And it's just a matter of making those things sort of match up, right? With Duolingo, it's a great example. There's a whole set of people that really want to learn a certain language. And the work of learning the language for themselves is meaningful because they get to learn a new language. Um, but that work doesn't need to go to waste. That work can go to, to helping translate all of the internet, right? And, and for GIF GIF, people are clicking next to view more GIFs on Reddit and on Tumblr and on all these other websites. Um, and so it's just a matter of taking that desire that people have and matching it with the desire we have, which is, sort of computationally defining what the emotive content of a GIF is. Um, so I think I think a lot of it has to just do with sort of like the serendipity of being in a conversation where one person acknowledges the need of the work and one person acknowledges the desires of the people and the conversation eventually sort of culminates in two people saying, oh, okay, then we can exactly just build this tool that sort of kills two birds with one stone. Right. Um, and sometimes it works better than other times, but uh, I think it's that mix of, of of having the conversations and having these sort of serendipitously come out. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts? Uh, Any other? Well, yeah, like as Gabe said, we all have like 20,000, 30,000 things that we could be doing, right. right? And then like, why would I want to label images for Google? And this is kind of obvious, but it's because right, I want to make, I want to spend my time doing something that I find is valuable, or at least I find is worth five minutes. And even as the novelty wears off, uh, if you can keep something that's sustained and you keep coming back to it, that's the, that's the key. So one question that kind of comes up out of that, out of this sort of discussion, of this there's sort a sort of discussion. ethical question, sort of ethical right, question. right, that some people raise about, people you know, raise. whether or not it's right to ask people, people to do this right. kind of thing without compensation. Kind of thing without compensation. The alternative that you would, might have the used would have been something like Mechanical Turk, which for those folks that don't know, is a system where you pay people a small amount of money to do this kind of classification. And here you're getting a kind of data set that I think is, you know, uh, maybe more meaningful because you're comparing people against each other, uh, different ratings to get at the best answer. Can you talk a little bit? I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the, the ethical questions. Do you feel there are any ethical questions here? I mean, I think that there always are. Uh, and I think the ethical questions come up most when there's like, when there's a wide range of demographics that are working on it, right? And so it maybe in this sense, it's a wide range of sort of age demographics that are that are using a tool because the the notions of uh, maybe take Facebook for example, take the issue of privacy with a lot of people, right? The ethics of what privacy meant in the 1960s is different than what privacy means in the 2000s, and so the people that grew up during those generations are going to have different different sort of base assumptions, and so then the ethics will come into play and it will get a little a little tricky. I think right. I think here though the the question of whether it, whether whether they whether we should be compensating the people that are doing this work for us, um, in our mind, it, it doesn't get approached as much because this is work work if you want to phrase it like that that they're already doing anyways. They're already enjoying the animated gifts, and I think we are providing them a value in that we're one giving them a tool that's fun for them, and so we're providing them entertainment for free, and two. Uh, the result of that entertainment that they're receiving is turning into a tool that they get to use later, which is this search functionality or this uh, results functionality. And so uh, 
while there's certainly ethical questions about about building it up, I think I think we're pretty confident that we're on the side of we're doing no evil. We're giving you a bunch of stuff for free, and we're increasing the global knowledge of the world. So let's go for it. I think. Right. Yeah. Like the fact that we're using this stream of clicks is, in a sense, deception, but it isn't a. It's very benign deception, right? Like, like there's this disconnect between what people are contributing and then how we use those votes. But the very fact that like we're we're very transparent about it, and we want to make users you know delightful and make them have fun. I, I think that. If that doesn't really address the ethical question, but I, that's another way to frame it. Yeah, I, I think it's interesting. It's something that certainly over time we're going to see, you know, going to have to address it more and more. I think, uh, you know, from my perspective, too, GIF GIF is super benign. But you could imagine that the same techniques that you guys are, that you're using could be used in a way that maybe is less benign. So far, most of the examples have been, have been quite benign and people, it's very transparent. And people, it's do you feel like the users, I don't know if you have any information about this, do you feel like the users feel like they're part of some greater purpose or is it really just fun? Because some of the other crowd working examples, like if you know Foldit, right, or Philo, these more science oriented crowd work um, uh, projects, they're really about solving big problems in science. How important do you think that aspect is for people here? Uh, you know, even for me, I think having that catalog set of gifts that I can just go to when I need to say something to somebody yeah. actually really important to me. Can you talk about that sense of purpose or a higher purpose? I mean, I think, I think the, the only data that we sort of have outside of our friends and who are probably biased to help us anyways is, is from, the, from the tweets that we actually see people putting out and a lot of the news articles, it, it specifically says like, help MIT do this or, or help something do this or help science by doing this, right? So they're all very excited about the fact that they feel like they're actually contributing to something. Um, I'm not sure whether that, that makes them feel like they're part of this grander solution or it just means that they feel like what they're doing isn't just a waste of time because they're helping a greater cause. Um, but I think we've definitely seen more more tweets come out that say like, help help these kids make this giant, the world's best gift gift or the gift database rather than tweets that say, uh, like have some fun for 20 minutes because you can click on GIFs and see a bunch of them, which which some of them do say that, but it seems like the majority of them are around this notion of like, let's rally together and like, let's build this great database. Right. So, um, so very interesting. Uh, Actually, Seamus asked a question, which I think you answered kind of early. Earlier, which is about using these uh, gifts to actually have a whole conversation, and I know that I use them in this way. I guess one question that I have for you is: Have you seen anybody, or have you heard any kind of feedback about whether or not it's actually facilitating more of those conversations? Do you have any plans to extend this to actually make it possible for people to uh, maybe have a dialogue? Are there any ideas about how you might extend these kind of ideas beyond just the catalog? There are a lot of uh, GIF messaging services. Uh, how I interpreted Seamus's comment was like, how can GIFs co communicate complex ideas? And I think we have to distinguish between something that is complex and something that contains a lot of context because GIFs have a lot of bandwidth, meaning that when I show you a GIF of, of Seinfeld, for instance, we, we, we can identify with the characters, we know their relationships. So those are like, that's a lot of sentences that you don't have to say, right? Whether or not you can write the constitution and justify it in gifts. Uh, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. Right. There's, <laughs> there's this, there, yeah. There is this spectrum between like specificity and complexity, right? And so maybe it's it's like a multi-dimensional spectrum. Maybe they're not on opposite ends of each other. But gifts aren't necessarily very specific. Maybe the closer your relationship is, if you have like a movie quote that you're quoting a lot and you use that in a very specific situation, uh, then it can work. But the the fact that the gifts can convey a very high level of complexity. Uh, which is open to human interpretation, I think is why it's valuable. It's like it's like uh, being able to watch a movie in German or Chinese or Japanese or a language you don't speak. You can still sort of get the gist of what's going on. You can still identify with the situation. You can identify whether two people are sort of enemies and who the good guy and who the bad guy is. Uh, and you don't need the, the actual specificity of those words to understand what's going on. And I, we think gifts are more like that, right? They don't, they don't put out the constitution in a German movie because they need that very specific <laughs> language. Um, but people still do watch foreign language movies because sort of the emotion that, that they experience through that and the context and the situation, the stories uh, are, are, if not better conveyed, uh, adequately conveyed through such a medium. So I think, it, I think the type of language um, is different than you would find in a complex sentence, but 
uh, just as important. Do you think you could use this kind of gamified design, the, the kind that you use, to do deeper inquiry on the content of the gifts? Because I think one of the things that you've done, which was very smart, is you ask people just to say, is this emotion contained in, in this image? Right, which is effectively how yeah. GIF GIF is designed. Could we use the same design to do deeper questions? Like not just is this emotion here, but what is this thing? Yeah, I think I mean there's been there's been lots of uh, interesting talk about how you how do you scale the project to get it a higher level of depth of what you can say about these gifts. Um, some of the way that ways that we've thought about doing that so far is if as we as we go forward and we release an API to the GIFs and an API to the data and it gets worked into messaging systems and things like that, um, it's possible to do sort of like analysis to see what the text that is surrounding these GIFs contains, right? So if I send like just had a great dinner and then a certain GIF, uh, I might be able to know something more about that GIF at, over the aggregate of over understanding how people are using that and in what context uh, it gets built out. Right. Um, it's definitely, it's definitely a challenging thing, though, to build straight into the, the front interface of the site because the simplicity of the interaction, I think, is key. And so while we could also have a text box that says, like, tell us a little bit about what this makes you feel or where you would use this, uh, we're nervous that that would sort of degrade from the, the simplicity of the experience and the simplicity of the project. So, right. Um, and computationally, uh, we'd have to get that very specific question answered for every single GIF uh, at least five or six times. To get a stable ranking. Is that the number of times uh, that we do is five to six? Uh, th that's it's like very ballpark. Yeah, uh, so it's it's very ballpark. And the other caveat we have is that uh, we weren't we weren't quite expecting the project to have as much success as it did. So uh, we were very conservative in how many in how <laughs> frequently we would add new gifts to the database. So we actually wound up getting about like forty votes per gift per question <laughs> overall. Then we couldn't add gifts fast enough to keep up with the traffic. Um, and so. So for future iterations, yeah, five to six, seven, eight um, is the range that we need for a stable ranking. But right now we're like way oversaturated on that point. So uh, you can trust the results pretty well, I think, right now. I, I trust them. Uh, I trust here's them. a question. <laughs> I, one thing that I noticed is there's not really a competitive element. Not really a competitive element. And it's not really designed to have a kind of individual competitive element or a team competitive element, which is something we often see with these kinds of crowd work and certainly crowdsourcing gamified examples. Can you talk about why you don't have a competitive element or what your thinking was about that? Did it even come into the mix? Did even come into the mix? I think I think a little bit of it was just focusing on the simplicity of the experience. Um, we did try when we were first trying to get the project off the ground. We were trying to sort of nudge a little competitiveness by by tweeting at say like Ward Pendleton, who's the creator of Adventure Time, being like, "Hey Ward, a bunch of your gifts are actually rated as like the most happy possible gifts around, right? So like you should be proud of that, and you should defend it, and you should tell other people to go vote on them, right?" Um, and I think as we as we go forward and we implement things like letting users submit their own content, some competitiveness might come into it where where they want their their face to be the happiest face, so they're competitively trying to make the best expression of happiness ever to put on the site. Um, but for for the first round, I think it was a matter of simplicity that we didn't really explore many of those routes. Right, and I, I don't think it ties in like, quite as nicely uh, as it would into something like the ESP game of image labeling. Right, the the, the most competitive that we can get is like is for someone to share. I just voted thirteen hundred times. Right. Right. And that. I'm not sure how many people would share that. <laughs> well, well, I think in, in some of those examples, right, part of the some idea of is to drive more usage. I think driving usage hasn't usage been a problem of yours, which is an unusual situation, unusual situation that, you know, if we were trying to do this, let's say, for a commercial we enterprise or commercial commercial you were trying to do this, um, you, were trying to you know, for a nonprofit dealing with a heavier subject, you might have, you know, less attachment. You kind of said at the very beginning that this was, you know, that you have good material to work with. If you were going to give one piece of advice, to people who need to do this kind of activity again. So it's a you know, company that needs to categorize a lot of data. It's a government entity trying to do that, a nonprofit, uh, other people at other cool programs trying to do what you did. What would be your number one sort of design advice for them uh, to be able to activate the crowd in this way and be able to um, deliver the kind of value that, that you've gotten out of people? Well, I think I think we were about to say different things, so I'll let Kevin go, and um, we'll see what he says, and then we'll we'll, we'll try both. Of okay, them. We'll, we'll compare, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so it's interesting that you bring that up, in that the White House just recently, like last week, released 
uh, something for healthcare, trying to get younger people to uh, sign up for healthcare, in which they have people vote on different gifts. And uh, it's very similar to Gift Give, but I, I feel what they missed out on was really focusing on designing on delight, right? That does every single thing on that page make you a little bit happier, a little bit joyful, right? But that's not to say to like, you, you want to compromise the, the seriousness of your site, but just like not having everything be so so stolid and so clean cut, right? Like make it more human, since that's ultimately who you want to engage. Cool. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And my my key my key was going to be to say like focus on the delight of the experience, right? Because if the goal is to whether it's mapping brain cells or it's comparing gifts or it's getting people to sign up for healthcare, the real goal of this is you want to make you want to make people's experience enjoyable. You want to make it something that they were happy they did and share uh, their happiness with other people. Happiness is a very viral sort of spreading phenomena. So um, focusing on the delight and focusing on not, not necessarily, you might lose a bit of efficiency in what you're trying to build. If we wanted people to it'd be more efficient to say, which click all the 17 emotions that categorize this gift, that would give us better data and more complex things, but sacrificing that higher efficiency for more delight, I think in the end drives more people. It makes it so that it's something not just good for your project, but also good for the world because you brought a little bit of joy and a little bit of happiness. Um, and I think, yeah, that is a design key is. is, right. is right. That's not to say that there's one way to do it. We're still learning every day, still trying to improve how we can do it. Sure. Uh, but, but just having yeah. that in mind but, and having it be the beacon. I think the idea, yeah, yeah Duchess, I think Duchess the idea is not really into that idea, but I think the concept of adding a little bit of happiness and delight to everything as a method of, you know, getting people to do things and feeling good about the things that they do is a brilliant insight. And this has been super, super interesting, you guys. Travis Rich and Kevin Hu from the MIT Media Lab. You can follow the Gift Gift project or GIF GIF project. You know, can I just say before we before we go about this topic, I was a GIF hard G sayer forever <laughs> until the creator came out like until last at the end of last year beginning of this year and was like no it's a gif with a soft g and i'm like this doesn't make any sense you're making me crazy but i'm glad that but so, he, so here's here's that that here's the rationale though right because the the problem is he has no control over that right it's language the person who invented the word canoe probably pronounced it with like a z and an m at the end and it was german instead of english right but the whole point of language is that it's like the consensus of what is what is understood. Right. Um, so one, there's no correct, because if you say GIF or GIF, I both know exactly what you mean. So that's language worked. Um, and two, the inventor of something doesn't get to control how it's said, right? There's no trademark on it. You can say whatever you want. But, but here's the thing that we're going to contribute to the dialogue. And all the users, please, we're going to have uh, GIF GIF users vote on how to pronounce it. <laughs> yeah. we'll, <laughs> we'll we'll how to it. pronounce GIF GIF. We'll have an Just Easter egg somewhere, and we'll, we'll get what the overall consensus is. That's great. Is, so. great. I think you're going to get gift. From my audience, you're going to get gift. From my audience, you're going to get gift. Thanks very much, you guys. Thanks for joining us. Follow the Gift Gift project at giftgift.media.mit.edu, and the Media Lab can be followed at Media Lab on Twitter. And for those of you who are able to come and join us, uh, Gamification Summit, gsummit.com, in San Francisco. Use the code DAMRAM to register. You'll come see me, BJ Fogg, 50 other people. It's going to be amazing. And uh, hopefully at some point we'll be able to get Travis and Kevin to come join us as well in San Francisco. In the meantime, thanks, you guys. Thanks so much for being with us. And thanks, thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining us on the Gamification Revolution. I'm your host, Gabe Zickerman. We'll see you all tomorrow for another webinar on gamification engagement. In the meantime, keep having fun. In the meantime, keep having fun.